Hello everyone, welcome back to chapter 13 for The Clay Marble by Ming Fong Ho. Let's go ahead and move into chapter 13 and see what happens now that Dara has found her mom again. Chapter 13. It was a magic marble, I told them, handing the smooth ball of clay to Grandpa Kim as we all sat around the fire that evening. I had just finished telling them everything that had led up to our reunion. I was snuggled against my mother, soaking in the warmth and concern of my family. If only Shanae had agreed to join us for dinner instead of stalking off on his own. I thought what a ping, with a pang of regret, he might have become part of my family. Grandpa Kim now held the marble and squinted at it in the firelight. Looks like any clay marble to me, he said. Are you sure it wasn't just plain old good luck that brought you back to us? He smiled and handed the marble over to Saroon. It was good thinking, not good luck, Saroon countered as he took the marble. She reasoned that she would find us back at the stone beam, and when she didn't, she and Shanae reasoned that we must have gone to Kung Silor's army camp for protection. After that, it was just a matter of time before we met up, that's all, he said, winking at me as he passed the marble to my mother without even glancing at it. You make it sound so simple. My mother said, taking the marble. What about my prayers? All those nights I lay awake praying for Dara's safety. She put her cheek on top of my head and nuzzled my hair. Maybe it was the magic marble, or maybe it was the Lord Buddha answering my prayers. What does it matter as long as you're back? She handed the marble over to Mia, who was sitting next to us. What do you think, Mia? I asked her. Is it magic marble? Mia weighed the marble in her hand before answering. Magic has a way of working for those who believe in it, she said slowly. Maybe it wouldn't have been magic for someone else, but you were brave and patient, Dara, and you believed in the marble, so maybe the magic worked for you. As she handed the marble back, she smiled at me. Anyway, sister, I'm happy you're back with us, she said. Sister, Mia called me sister. I took the marble from her and held it tightly. She was just being affectionate. Or did she mean something more? I looked at her, trying to read her smile. I'm glad to be back too, sister, I said using the last word pointedly. Around me, the others laughed. Have you guessed then? Saroon asked. What? I asked, squeezing the marble. Let it be true, I begged silently. Let Nia become my sister-in-law. That Nia and I plan to get married soon? <gasps> it worked. I burst into a delighted grin. No doubt about it, there was powerful magic in this marble. It felt hard and compact in my hands and even seemed a bit heavier now. It didn't matter if no one else quite believed in it. I was sure it had guided me back to the stone beam, helped me find my family, and in some mysterious way even linked Saroon and Mia. Carefully, I pocketed the marble, then smiled at Saroon and Mia. Their hands were linked, just like our little clay dolls, I thought. It was all happening just the way Jean Tu had hoped. They would get married and our two families would all be together, living in airy, newly thatched houses by the side of the lake. Together we would sow our rice seed in the rainy season and together harvest the fields when it turned cool. We would be surrounded by babies and bountiful harvests and peace and laughter. Wait till I tell Jean Tu, I said gleefully. Let's go to Cao Ai Ding and get her tomorrow. What's the rush? Saroon asked. There's plenty of time yet. But it's been over a week since I've seen Jean too, I blurted out indignantly. I want to make sure baby's all right. Oh, I'm sure he's fine, Saroon said placently. Cao Ai Ding is one of the most protected refugee camps around here. Besides, you can't go rushing off to see them. It's too far away to walk, and you need a special pass to ride up one of those trucks, to ride on one of those trucks or vans that go back and forth between Nong Chan and Cao Ai Ding. How do we get special passes, I asked. I'll have to ask my commanding officer, Saroon said, sticking out his chest. It'll probably take time. Not too much time, I hope, Mia said quietly. The monsoon rains are starting. If we want to prepare the seed beds and get the rice seeds sown, we'll have to leave very soon. She passed in the platter of fried banana fritters she had prepared as a special treat for this reunion dinner and helped him to the crispiest fritter. We should get John Chu out and then start for home as soon as possible, or we may miss the planting season altogether. The planting season, Saroon echoed as if he was mystified about what it was. 
I can't think about planting seasons right now. I've got more important things to consider. Like what? I asked. The flag raising, of course. It's only 12 days away, he said, his mouth full of banana. I'm going to be marching in it, doing complex drills before the prince. Although he hadn't enlisted in Count Siler's army, Sarun exclaimed, he had volunteered to take part in the special drills and would have to train every day. I listened as Sarun also described, the eyes glowing, how he had learned to load a gun and take aim. You have to know how to sight the target, Sarun said, demonstrating with the rifle he had kept propped against him. He cocked his head and in deadly earnest squinted down the length of the gun. He suddenly looked so severe and belligerent that I was unnerved. I thought of the way he had looked marching in the square that afternoon, his shoulders back, his head high, his mouth set, looking as if he had been a soldier all his life. And I suddenly realized with a sinking feeling in my heart that he had been enjoying himself. My brother liked being a soldier. What about the special pass for us to go to Cao Ai Dang? Nia asked him now. Will you ask for it tomorrow? Sarun frowned. Don't rush me, he said. I'll get around to it. He took the last fritter off the plate and stuffed it in his mouth. There was nothing left on the platter except for a few crumbs. Sarun had not even thought to pass the platter around, let alone leave anyone else a fritter or two. I reached over and took one of the crumbs. It was sweet and crunchy and still lightly warm. The next morning, Nia and I watched Sarun go off in his military practice. Silhouetted against the morning light, he reminded me of the time he used to go off to the paddy fields at dawn, a hoe on his shoulder. The only difference was that instead of a hoe, there was now a gun. As he disappeared into the forest, Nia sighed. It was a small, discouraged sound. He's changed, hasn't he? She said. I nodded gloomily. I remember when I first met him. Nia continued wistfully. He was always talking about planting a good rice crop and fishing in the lake. I know, I said, thinking of how Sarun had told Nia how nice our village was the day he had come back from his first mass distribution. He never talks about that anymore. All he seems to care about now is war and weapons, how to plant landmines when target shooting is, how to march around in formation. Can you tell him you want to go back home to the farming soon? I've tried, Dara. There's even a caravan leaving for CM Reap in about two weeks, and I had wanted to join it. But when I asked Sarun about it, he got angry. Well, then get angry back at him. Tell him you want... I can't, Dara. I don't want to fight with him. He's going to be my husband. And besides, he said we could go on the next caravan. Sure, or the next one, or the next one, I retorted. At this rate, we'll be too late. If we don't make it back soon, how will we have time to plow the land and sow the rice seed? Nia sighed. I don't know, Dara, she said dejectedly. There's nothing we can do about it. I thought for a moment. Yes, there is, I said. We can make the preparations for leaving now. Clean and oil the ox carts, load them up, and pick up John too, all in time to join the caravan. Nia stared at me incredulously. All by ourselves, she whispered, without telling Sarun. He doesn't need to know, and he probably wouldn't be interested anyways, I answered. But do you realize how heavy each sack of rice is? Nina asked. We can back the cart right up to the tents where the sacks are stored, I countered quickly. And do you know how many sacks there are? We will stack them up carefully so the cart doesn't get lopsided. And what about the tools and the nets? Of course, we'd have to spread the tarp over the things and strap it down with good thick rope. And what about the carts? They're not even cleaned or oiled. Our rear wheels was already creaking badly on our way here. We'll just have to grease the axle, I said. Do you know how? Nia demanded. I'll learn. Nia shook her head. No, there's no way we could possibly do all that. I jutted my chin at her defiantly. We can and we will, I said. Frowning, Nia looked at me as if she were seeing me for the first time. You've changed too, Dara, she said slowly. You didn't used to be this, this rude, I suggested. Nia smiled. Either that or this sure of yourself, she said. I reached in my pocket and squeezed the magic marble. Well, where shall we start? How about with cleaning the ox carts? Nia laughs, 
Mia's laugh was exasperated. All right, she said, we might as well give it a try. That same morning, Mia and I dragged out my family's ox cart and swept it clean of all the broken twigs, straw, and spider webs that weeks of neglect had heaped on it. It was good to get on its warped planks again, to fill its rough sides and its smooth wooden wheels. After we finished cleaning and repairing my ox cart, we did the same for Nia's. Satisfied that both were in good enough condition to make the long trip home, we turned our attention to the oxen. Like the carts, they had been neglected for some time and looked mangy and dirty. We led our oxen to one of the deeper mud holes and scrubbed them down there. They seemed to enjoy the water and would twist around and stare at us with their long lashed eyes, snorting warm moist breaths on us. We're going home, I murmured to the small ox as I splattered more cool water over him. You'll be feeling the monsoon rains on your back soon and churning up the soft mud in the fields again. How about that? He snorted, and Nia and I laughed. Cleaning the ox carts and the oxen kept us pleasantly busy for a few days, but the next step would be trickier. All the supplies we had accumulated during the mass distributions, the sacks of rice grain and rice seed, the hoe heads and rope and fishnets and tarpaulin would have to be loaded onto the ox cart and then strapped down. This was strenuous work, usually reserved for the men. Together, we backed our ox carts up to the tent where our sacks of rice and rice seed were stowed. We each grabbed a corner of the sack and lifted. Half running and half stumbling with the sack of rice held between us, Nia and I headed for one of the ox carts, probably looking very much like a crab scuttling across the sand. But we managed to reach the cart and even to swing the sack neatly into it. Nia wiped the sweat from her forehead. We did it, she said, sounding very surprised. I told you we could. I grinned, panting. Again and again we did this, moving sack after sack from the shelter of the blue tarp and into the wagon. After a while, there was a layer too deep of the pre precious rice seed bags on the bottom of the ox cart. If we planted the rice seeds with care, and if the weather was good, I knew that the seeds we brought home in the cart would be enough to supply half the village next year. I felt a deep satisfaction that these seeds, at least, would not be broken and crushed to feed the soldiers here. The next day, we hauled the bags of rice grain into the carts, putting them over the rice seed. Each sack, eight sacks to a layer, three layers thick in each of the two carts. At first, Mother and Grandpa Kim were reluctant to help, fearing Sarun's anger, but then they took to giving us a hand too. After the bags of rice were loaded on, there was still more to be done. We cleaned the mud and rust out of the, off of the hoe heads and other tools left lying out in the open behind our shelter. Carefully, we packed them in the ox cart on top of the rice bags. We washed and dried our clothes and scrubbed our kettle and pots. We gathered straw for the oxen for the trip home. We draped the sheet of blue plastic tarpaulin over everything to keep things protected and dry. And finally, we strapped it down with sturdy rope double knotting it. By the end of it, my back was so sore that it hurt terribly, even to stand straight. And Nia said that her shoulders felt as if they were on fire. But when I stood back and looked at the two ox carts, now piled high with rice grain and rice seed, packed tight with tools and fishnets, covered with the blue tarp and strapped with strong rope, I felt a surge of satisfaction. Our timing had been excellent. There were three days left before Sarone's all-important flag raising and five before the caravan to see him reap would leave. All we had to do now was bring John Tu and Baby back from the hospital at Cow Eye Bank, wait for Sarone to perform his military rituals at the flag raising ceremony, and then hitch our ox carts up and drive on home. Gratefully, I held the magic marble in my hand and thanked it. and thanked it for having had things work out so neatly. Nothing, I thought, could hold us back now. And that is the end of chapter 13. We will pick up with chapter 14 tomorrow, and we will see, will they be able to go get John too in time for them to leave, to head back with the caravan to see him reap their hometown. See you tomorrow.